Hello, my name is Katherine Mahaffey and I'm a volunteer for the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library's Oral History Program. I'm here today with Professor Emerita, Dr. Judy Everson. Today is session two. In session one, Dr. Everson talked about the founding of Sangamon State University. As the slide shows, an entity carved out of the cornfields in Springfield, Illinois. In session one, Dr. Everson described some of the administrators and founding faculty members who were instrumental to the university's beginning and who made a difference in the Springfield community. Today, we will talk about four more faculty members who were on board at the founding and learn about Dr. Everson's own career and contributions as a, fac as a faculty member at Sangamon State University, now known as the University of Illinois at Springfield. And before we begin, we'd like to thank Tom Wood, the archivist at UIS, for his help in gathering the pictures of the faculty members Dr. Everson will talk about today. Okay, our first photo is of Dr. Mark Heyman, and he served as an apprentice to Frank Lloyd right before coming to Sangamon State. That's right. Uh, Mark is a good illustration of the diverse types of backgrounds that the founding faculty brought with them. He had been teaching urban planning uh, and environmental studies at Penn State University, but the more interesting part of his background for Springfield turned out to be his connection to Frank Lloyd Wright. From 1954 until 1959, Mark was one of Wright's last apprentices. There were about 40 of them. He said that Frank Lloyd Wright interviewed him for one of these coveted slots at the Plaza Hotel in New York City, and he was thrilled to be chosen. And they spent their summers at Talies and West in Spring Bring, Wisconsin, but they, sent, they spent their winters out at Talies and East. Uh, excuse me, I got that reversed. Taliesin East was in Wisconsin. Taliesin West, where they spent their winters, was in Arizona. And he had wonderful memories of working with Wright, and his expertise in Frank Lloyd Wright became critical uh, at the point that in 1981, the Frank Lloyd Wright designed Dana Thomas House here in Springfield was given up by the Thomas Publishing Company and was acquired through the efforts of Governor Jim Thompson by the state for a million dollars. Mark then began to share his expertise in Wright, not only on campus with courses and conferences, but at very well attended public lectures downtown at Lincoln Public Library. 150, 200 people would come to hear him tell about knowing Wright and demythologizing Wright. Uh, and so I thought people would enjoy hearing about the contribution that Mark Heyman made. And he was an urban planner? Yes, in environmental studies. And when he got the opportunity, he loved telling people about um, the contributions of Wright to modern design, uh, not only architecture, but also landscape architecture. Okay. And this photo of him that you, our viewers just saw was of him posed in front of the Dana Thomas house. Okay. And uh, then we have Dr. John Kaiser, who was the longest serving VP of Academic Affairs at Sangamon State. Right. John was another of our founding faculty members. He came to us from the faculty of Eastern Illinois. His PhD in labor history, his specialty, was from U of I. Um, he was elected the first speaker uh, of the university assembly when we had a unicameral faculty, administrative staff, civil service staff, student and community body, governing body. He was the first elected speaker. He served the first year in that very responsible position. And then when our acting VPAA, Ernst Giesecke, retired, John became the vice president for academic affairs. And his background in labor history served him well because there was unrest among the labor, the troops, at a number of times, and he straddled the fence between being a historian and faculty member and teacher and researcher, but also being somebody who was in a pretty powerful administrative position. 
And I thought it would be interesting for people to know that not only did he publish a book with U of I Press on the history of Illinois from 1865 to 1898, but he also, in his spare time, of which there was none, uh, he did weekly columns on Illinois history nuggets, gems, um, like the Piasaw bird down on the, on the, on the Illinois River. Uh, outside of Alton, and he pulled those together and published a book called Illinois Vignettes. So he was someone who also tried to share his expertise, as Mark Heyman did, with the community. And he had kind of an interesting background too, wasn't he? In uh, a football player. That's before right. He the, how many began how many his people, scholarly work? <laughs> how many people know labor history, become an academic vice president, publish uh, scholarly works, but also newspaper columns for weekly newspapers, and used to play for the Canadian Football League? <laughs> uh, so he was he was a, a multifaceted talent. Interesting. Um, and the next faculty member um, is. Um, someone who broke ground in the field of gerontology, a true pioneer and ahead of her time. Yes, this is Dr. Gary Lesnoff Caravaglia. And she came to us from California. Her uh, doctorate in philosophy and education was earned at the University of California. Uh, she did all of her academic work there, and she brought with her to the founding faculty as one of the three women hired, uh, she brought an interest in particular philosophical issues that were way ahead of their time, but she also was interested in and helped to found in the, in the mid-1970s one of the few and one of the first gerontology programs in the country. Uh, this, she was at the cutting edge. I remember one of her very popular philosophy courses was called What is a Good Death? She was interested in looking at all of the issues surrounding dying and death way before that was commonplace in academe, let alone in medical schools. And as SIU Medical School came on board in the 70s here, she and people from SIU worked together to help to arouse not only academic interest, but popular interest, public interest in questions around gerontology. Uh, she did uh, international conferences, she did them, hosted them at SSU, but she also, also took students and members of the community to places like Russia where she had international contacts. Uh, so she was pivotal, I think, as an example of a pioneer, not only in helping midwife the birth of a university, but also in a field of gerontology, uh, which we were a pioneer in thanks to her efforts and leadership. So Sangam State had several or had programs in the field then to offer students. That's right, both in philosophy, we had coursework, and in gerontology. Okay, excellent. And of course, this next gentleman, um, you know well, this is your late husband, yes. Dr. David Everson. And I thought Dave would be a good example of a faculty member who did, um, Similarly to these previous people, he showed strength in his academic field, which was political science, but he also did a lot of outreach to the community in the area of public affairs, because with our location in the state capitol, we were expected and our faculty were expected to make a prominent contribution in the area of public affairs. His doctorate, which came from Indiana University, earned at the same time mine was, was in uh, American voting behavior and also comparative state politics. And when he got here, um, he uh, was the coordinator of our first major winter intercession, which was an intensive one-week seminar that was for students. There were 200 who were enrolled, but the public could also come. It was held down at the Capitol campus, which was in the old Leland building, so it was very accessible. He he sponsored this particular intercession on the crisis in confidence in American 
polity, government, during the Nixon years with the Vietnam War. Uh, and he brought in Washington Post and New York Times journalists like David Broder and Tom Wicker to address huge standing room only auditorium uh, uh, audiences. Uh, and so that was an example of his attempt not only to teach students, but to give local people and area people exposure to those whose op-eds they'd been reading for years, but now they could do a Q&A with these world-class writers. Uh, he also was instrumental uh, in directing for really almost 20 years the Illinois Legislative Studies Center. He oversaw uh, the internship program. He oversaw uh, a publication called Comparative State Politics. Uh, he uh, wrote for Illinois Issues. He was a public affairs commentator at election night on the local TV stations and on our FM radio station when we got it. Um, so he really did a lot of outreach. And a good example of that is the photo that people can see now. In 1996, three years before his death, he was working as an associate chancellor for Dr. Naomi Lin. And Hillary Clinton, who was then First Lady, was making a visit to our campus and also to our sister campus, Lincoln Land. We had 2,200 people who were vying for seats in the auditorium. And Dave's job for a week before her visit was to work with her security staff uh, uh, to make sure that everything was safe for her to come and speak to this crowd. So uh, it all went well, and afterwards she was kind enough to, to have a photograph taken with him and to send him a thank you letter. Uh, and he enjoyed referring to her equivalent person in her staff. He said, I'm going to make your life hell for the next week. I'm the security Nazi. So they bonded uh, <laughs> during this event. But it was another good example of how we shared the auditorium and our guest speakers with the community. There were students there, but there were also a lot of faculty um, uh, and, and uh, community people. And he also, after he had published six scholarly books in his field of American voting behavior, he began a second career as a mystery writer, and his six published mystery novels uh, were set in Springfield and featured a detective who worked for a thinly disguised version of Michael Madigan. Uh, coincidentally, our son Chris worked for Michael Madigan, but uh, he made a few changes to avoid libel suits or anything of that kind. Anyway, this photograph shows Dave and me attending a Mystery Writers of America conference uh, out in San Diego. Uh, and uh, uh, he enjoyed writing those books, which had a lot of local color in them, and they flew off the shelves. And he continued writing them until his death in 1999. My goodness. All right. Well, um, let's talk about your career now. We have a picture of Dr. Everson in her element in the classroom. Um, in session one, we talked about your aspirations to earn advanced degrees. Yet there were very few female college professors to serve as role models when you were growing up. So tell me about the people who were your early influencers. Okay, I have to say my parents, uh, my father was a graduate of Indiana University with a master's, um, and he uh, edited the school newspaper there during the Depression. Uh, that's where he met my mother. She was a school teacher with a degree from Indiana. And they both dealt with language. They respected the importance of words and communication in their professions. My dad edited the newspaper in our hometown. My mother was a lifelong tenured master teacher in our hometown. So I grew up with a working mother. Um, and uh, it, I learned very quickly that they, who had worked their way through Indiana during the Depression, set no arbitrary limits on what their three children, of whom I was the oldest, could achieve. It was always understood that I would go to college, and it was always understood that if I worked hard, I could go as far as I dreamed of going. They never told me when I said, I'd like to be a teacher, but at the college level, oh, you can't do that. Girls don't do that. They never, nobody ever said no to me. And in my high school, I had the great good fortune of having a communication and public speaking teacher, uh, Dr. William Grider, 
who encouraged me to put myself out there, not to be shy, but to believe that I could aspire to write original orations and deliver them to our entire student body, which I did four years in a row, I would never have thought I could do that. But he didn't say, oh no, you can't do that. He said in the equivalent in 1956, you go girl. So I, I like to think that those early influences were important. When I got to Indiana State uh, in Terre Haute as an undergraduate, I had no women faculty members, uh, except I, it, when I took PE, then I did. But other than that, there were no women faculty members that taught me in the English department or in the speech communication department, which was where I was doing all my study. And yet, though I had male faculty and male mentors to a man, and they were men, they encouraged me to aspire. They wrote reference letters to every Big Ten school. I applied to all ten, and there were ten then. They, they, were, they championed me, uh, and they were so proud of the fact that I was admitted to all ten and that I went on to get my doctorate. So I had male mentors who backed me 100% although that was still something rare for women to be encouraged to do in 1960-64. But my greatest stroke of good luck was meeting my husband, who was a fellow debater on the Indiana State debate team. We won the national my freshman year, Dave's sophomore year, and Dave had a working mother. She was a nurse. Hmm. So I married a man who said, I don't expect you to put me through grad school. I'm happy that we're going to go together, and we did. We chose Indiana University, which offered us both fellowship assistantship, and I took my classes right along with him, uh, and that, that, that was our plan. And then when we got our jobs here, which we'll talk about later, Dave was 100% supportive of that as well. So I felt blessed that I never had anybody important to me from parents teachers, mentors, and my husband, who said, that's unrealistic, settle. They said, achieve your dream, go for your ambition. And, and uh, you've mentioned, too, that Dave was so supportive once your son Chris arrived. Yes. And we, in acknowledging right. that, you know, all of this is shared home as well as, as our work lives. Fifty-fifty split. My son, if he were here, he's working at IDOT, but if he were here, your fellow Knox grad, he would tell you his father took as much care of him as I did. We arranged our teaching schedules so that one of us could be with him virtually all the time. And we traveled with him to professional meetings. Meetings. He, Dave shared all of those responsibilities with me and was very close to our son. He was a hands-on dad uh, before that became the fashion, and he was totally supportive of my career and of the sacrifices that that involved in terms of my standard of housekeeping. You told the story in our first session about how you and Dave found the job at Sangamon State yep. and about the nepotism rule at SIU at the time where Dave was a faculty member, which has since changed and now husbands and wives can both be professors at, at the university. Um, but I, I mention that because then when you arrived at Sangamon State, um, you had not yet completed your dissertation. You must have felt fortunate to have two more senior female faculty colleagues um, at Sangamon State when you arrived. Yes, the whole reason we came, as you has, have alluded to, was that although Dave had a tenure-track faculty position at SIU Carbondale, where our son was born, I had taken time out to become a mother, uh, they could not hire me or would not because they had a nepotism policy that was still legal then. Gradually, in the early 70s, which was when we came to SSU, that became illegal under equal opportunity employment legislation. But at the time, it was legal. And Dave said, I'll give up this tenure track position, uh, and uh, we will go uh, anywhere that will interview both of us and hire both of us. And SSU was the place that did that. So we moved here in 1970 to be part of the founding faculty. There were three women and 42 men. Mm -hmm. And that represents the fact that there were far fewer women to choose from for faculty positions, and 
I was the junior, I was only 28, I was still ABD, I was by far the junior one of those, and although I respected Gary and admired her, uh, she was not a colleague in my department, which was English. Jackie Jackson, who was also my senior, had published a number of children's books, was well known in her field, and we bonded and I team taught with her, and I was so grateful that they were there and that I wasn't the Lone Ranger. You came to Sangamon State to be a faculty member in the English Department in American Studies. Do I have that correct? My PhD was in American Studies and Speech Communication, and I taught in the English Department because they needed people to teach American literature. I also taught for a while in the History Department because my multidisciplinary background allowed me to teach American History. I taught in the Communication Department. We were versatile. <laughs> we were utility infielders back then with only 45 people. I could teach public speaking and persuasion, but but my real love was teaching literature, and that's what I ended up focusing on, and that's where I stood for tenure. So, and, and because um, Sangamon State was new and the emphasis was on innovation, there were funds available to develop new, different kinds of courses, and I just wondered, you know, if there are any that come to mind in your particular field. We were teaching new kinds of students at that time. These were part-time adult commuters, we were also teaching new kinds of students in the, at the undergraduate level, junior and senior years. We were teaching community college transfers from all over the state and indeed from all over the region. We were also teaching new kinds of courses. Our curriculum was supposed to be responsive to change in the broader world. And a good example of that would be uh, if there was something that had we had not studied when we were getting our graduate degrees, but that there was an interest in now, students would approach us or colleagues would approach us and say, you know, we need a course in that. Mm -hmm. And an example would be science fiction and film. Mm -hmm. uh, I never had a chance to take a class like that, but then it became very fashionable later. But I developed a course in that, and, and I loved being able to be at the cutting edge in my own field. Another example is women's studies. Just as women were beginning to come back to school more and more, and to become the majority of the student body eventually. So women were coming into academe more and more. We were the pioneers, but there were others following us. And women's studies became the academic expression of that pent up interest in the other half of humanity. So I was asked to teach courses with Jackie Jackson on the background of the women's liberation movement. Well, we never studied that in school because it didn't exist then. So we were constantly being asked to be supple intellectually and to be at the cutting edge of our fields. We were also teaching conventional classes like the American novel 1865 to 1915, but it was fun to have that blend and balance. Okay, and you mentioned to me that one of the toughest challenges early in your career was serving on the tenure committee. That was, I think, around 1973. Why was yes. that? Yes, when they first opened the doors to students in the fall of 1970, those of us who had been hired the previous spring had been told that our university, among its many innovations, would not have tenure, that we would simply have renewable contracts each year based on our performance in the, in the previous academic year. So we had not necessarily felt pressed, those of us, and there were about six or seven, who had not completed our dissertations, to rush that through when we were doing institution building and developing so many new courses. But all of a sudden, the Board of Regents, our governing board based here in Springfield, said, you know, all the other public universities in the state have tenure, and so do the private colleges, and you people need to get you need to stand for tenure. And they said this to our entire faculty. Well, we had to develop a tenure procedure. And in 1973, those like my husband, who had already been teaching elsewhere, were forced to stand for tenure. I didn't have to till 76, because they give 
uh, early faculty a, a longer period to show what they can do. But I was elected as the representative from the arts and sciences okay. as one of, there were five colleges or clusters of faculty and I was chosen to represent them. And when my husband's tenure case came up, came up, I had to recuse myself and be nowhere near anywhere where the discussions of his tenure took place. But I had to sit in judgment of my early colleagues. And it was very, very difficult. We um, did not want to be guilty of uh, establishing too low a bar, but we also didn't want to err on the side of unfairness, and it ended up that it was a punishing period, but we felt that we exercised our con our conscience, uh, and uh, uh, it, it was controversial because we'd all bonded in ways that are mm -hmm. hard to imagine, and when we had to say to some of our faculty who had applied, we think you would have a better fit el elsewhere, we don't see you as part of the long-term future of the institution where it seems to be headed, this was a bitter blow and I could appreciate that. And so it was a very tough professional call, uh, but uh, I'm proud of the work we did. I'm gonna shift gears a moment to what was happening in the community about that time. Uh, when Sangamon State was open, the public schools in Springfield were about to be desegregated. And, yes. and you've told us about Dr. Gus Stevens um, efforts to help the local schools with that transition, but you too played a part in that. That's right. One of the innovations at, U, at SSU uh, was interdisciplinary and team teaching. That wasn't common at that time around the country, but we did a lot of it. As I mentioned, the team talk courses I did with Jackie Jackson. Well, this interracial education institute that was offered from 72 to 74 for a total of 250 district 186 coaches, counselors, librarians, teachers, you know, principals, uh, this was an interdisciplinary faculty. We had political science represented, sociology, education, history, and I was there to represent language and literature. And the class that I taught in 72, 73, and 74 for five weeks, eight hours a day as a summer institute for these people from the district was focused on making them more aware of issues of African American language, images in literature, uh, stereotypes and alternatives to those for their classroom use. Uh, and uh, it was a very exciting challenge. After it was over, each summer we went and visited the teachers that we had worked with the previous summer. We went to their classrooms uh, and, and talked with them about how it had helped them, how we could refine what we were doing. I look back on that with pride, and I think it was a real contribution we made to Springfield. As I mentioned in my prior interview, we got through integrating the public schools under court-mandated order with busing without any violent incidents. And I don't, I'm sure we were not totally responsible for that, but I like to think we played a role. In that same vein, in 1975, you were involved with Illinois Issues Magazine, mm -hmm. which is one of the many lasting contributions made by the university to the community. What, what was your role with Illinois Issues? I was a book review editor each each month, we came out every month, each month uh, we selected a book on some aspect of Illinois history, culture, uh, and we would invite a, a distinguished academic or public figure to review that book. Uh, and in the summer, we would do a special feature uh, and I loved doing that. I also edited uh, humanities essays, and we would select prominent people from uh, Chicago, from East St. Louis, from around the state uh, to do those essays. But let me mention two book reviews and one essay that I think our listeners might enjoy. Because we were a public affairs magazine for the entire state, uh, I had gotten to know uh, informally or formally a number of the prominent political leaders. And I asked former Governor Dan Walker when he was serving time in Duluth at the Federal Penitentiary if he would review a book, nobody better because he had authored the report, he had been in charge of the commission on the 1968 police riot during the Democratic Convention in Chicago. There was a new book that had come out on that and I wrote to 
Governor Walker uh, in the prison and asked if, sent him a copy of the book and said, I think our readers would be very interested in your viewpoint as an eyewitness and the author of the commission report on that. He sent me back his first draft of a review and it was all about him and not about the book. And I had to write him back, as sometimes I had to do with students, and I had to say, you know, Governor, this is very interesting, but my readers want to know what you thought about the book. And he wrote me back and he said, I can do better. And he did, and we published that review. Um, now, I had hosted a cocktail party when Dan Walker was campaigning, walking Dan, in my home. <laughs> so I went back with him a good ways, but the other person that I knew well, was knew better, was Jim Edgar. And when he became governor, his son and mine had played basketball for Glenwood together. I had coached Jim on speech and had helped with some of his speech writing. I contacted Jim and I said, you know, I happen to know, because you've shared it with me, that you're a great reader of political biographies. And I'd like to do a feature, a spread, on why it's important for Illinois leaders to be readers. He gave me a wonderful interview on some of his favorite political biographies. Um, and um, yeah, Zapata uh, was, I mean, it was people you might not have thought. Um, Lyndon Johnson, uh, it, it, I thought it was fascinating. And that was part of what I enjoyed doing was connecting the readers of Illinois issues who were all over the state to the take of political figures as well as academics about what was happening, what was worth reading. Sounds like great features. Um, I just also want to go back to your career moment and, and just mention that you served as chair of the English department at three different points in your career. The first time was in 1976. And that when I saw that, it brought to mind the lack of traditional university organizational structure um, at Sangamon State. And I just wonder if that made it more easy or more difficult to take on a position like chair. It definitely made it harder, Catherine. Um, at, a, at a traditional department, uh, you would have had an en ensconced department chair who would have been a senior faculty member and who would have been in charge of uh, a staff uh, secretary and, and others, assistants, who would have, if it were a large department, uh, who would have had a lot of authority and control, uh, a lot of say in who got hired, in what got taught, in how people were reviewed when they were standing for promotion or tenure. Um, and in our environment, we were so small, we were a handful of people, we didn't have anybody who was truly senior who had come up through the ranks because we had just gotten off the ground ourselves. And some of the most senior faculty we had, like Jackie Jackson, who was a teacher of writing and was writing uh, a great deal, would, would really wouldn't it wouldn't have served their career, inter career interests or the institution's interests to have them putting on an administrative hat, and so it fell to consensus people and utility infielders like me uh, to kind of step in and do that. But you had to operate by consensus. Uh, there, we were not called a department. Uh, we were called a program. I was not called a chair. I was called a convener. I not only had all my colleagues, there were maybe six or seven tops, but we had elected student representatives, one graduate, one undergraduate, from the students we were serving. I had a grad assistant, that's what I had, for support, and it fell to me to kind of herd those cats. Uh, and I, I enjoyed it because I thought I could do it, and I knew that nobody else was really able or willing to step into that role, but it took me out of the classroom one class a semester, and I hated that. Yes. But I said yes, so, okay. okay. And I'm glad, I'm sure they were glad you did. <laughs> they were glad they didn't. <laughs> um, you were involved in a women's study publication on campus during that time, 77 to 79. Yes, women's studies, a totally new field that had been an outgrowth of the women's movement uh, in public life and then in academic life, the response was, well, 
we need more courses on women and what they've contributed. And um, so women's studies was the answer to that. And we had a mostly women, although there were some brave men who also helped us, who put together a women's studies minor. Uh, we were not a major, but we were a minor, and we had a number of popular elective courses. And one of the services we provided continuing ed workshops for the community in areas for women returning to work, returning to school. Uh, but we also sponsored a publication called the XX Chromosome Chronicle. And I was asked as one of the contributors each time it came out, it was supposed to be a monthly, but we ended up calling it a periodical uh, because it didn't always get out on time. My job was to write a column called What Did You Say? And it was to sensitize readers to sexist, implications in the English language, of which at that time there were many. Over the years, we've become much more aware that we don't say chairman if it's a chairwoman, or we might say chair. But at that time, we needed to help people over that hump. And my job in my monthly or periodical column was to talk about things that I had heard, things that I had read, and try to raise people's consciousness. Okay. And then in 1978, you served as the moderator for a debate on women's equal on the women's equal rights amendment. Yes. And the debaters were Karen DeCrow and Phyllis Shafley. Yes. So how did that go? Well, this was a huge <laughs> issue nationally because ratification was going state by state. The ERA had been proposed years before and had lost, but it had been revivified because of the women's movement and women's studies. And so women were once again campaigning, not only for it, but there were women who were strongly opposed to it. And so it was a hot button issue and Illinois was a hot button state. And the reason we were so important was it, it was a, a question whether or not it would actually get enough votes around the country. Illinois was a pivotal state, and the defeat here ended up being one that uh, helped to cost the ERA the ratification. But before it was known that this was the outcome, uh, there was a debate scheduled at Springfield High School because we didn't yet have the big auditorium in the Public Affairs Center to host it on campus. It was held at the auditorium at Springfield High School. And I was asked as a women's studies faculty member, would I moderate the debate? Karen DeCrow was the national president of, the, of NOW, uh, which was the national organization for women. Mm -hmm. and. She was going to be debating Phyllis Schlafly of Alton, Illinois, who was the public face and public spokeswoman for the opposition to the ERA. She felt that it was going to perhaps grant women some rights that they didn't have, but it was going to take away some liberties that they did have, and she came down opposed. So my job was to show up that night and moderate this debate, and I was a nervous wreck because I knew how high feelings ran in the community and around the state on this issue, having testified on it to the legislature. So I get there that night, and the first surprise I had was I was backstage uh, waiting to meet the principals, and they were driven there and got there, and here they were gonna be facing off in the debate they were doing this all around the country. They had become fast friends, and they embraced, and they began asking each other about their relatives and checking up on their health. And you know, it was obvious they had become, if not bosom buddies, at least friends. And then the second startling thing that happened to me before we went out was that somebody backstage passed me a note, and it said, Dr. Everson, we have received a rumor that we think is credible that during the debate, somebody is going to come out on the stage and throw a custard pie in Phyllis Schlafly's face. Well, although personally I took the opposite view of her on the ERA, I did not want to see her humiliated as a guest. Uh, we, the, the university was sponsoring this. I didn't want to see her humiliated. During the whole debate, I was looking both to the wings. I was watching in front. I didn't know where this was going to come from. It never came. Oh, good. And so I breathed a sigh of relief. <laughs> that must have been very tense. It was. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move to the 1980s. Um, you became the Associate Dean of Arts and Sciences in 1980, and one of your accomplishments during this time was that you fought a trend that was brought on in 
in decreasing enrollments, and that was colleges and universities were reducing, and in some cases, eliminating foreign language programs. But you found a way locally to yes. maintain that. This was an example of innovation, and I was so pleased that it happened on my watch as dean because I could exercise some leadership over it with the help of Senator Paul Simon, who at the national level was vociferous in his support that we not only needed to be teaching people English, but that everybody needed to be fluent in more than one language. So he was kind of an ally at the national level, supportive of what I was trying to do. Uh, I put together a five school coalition Lincoln Land and at that time Springfield College in Illinois and our university, SSU, but the two uh, private colleges in Jacksonville, which was only half an hour away, Illinois College and McMurray College. Uh, it, we got a HECA grant, Higher Education Cooperation Grant, uh, and it was for uh, $50,000. It was very impressive. Uh, I drafted it, uh, and it basically promoted an idea of how each of these schools could contribute something to a consortium that would broaden foreign language instruction for all of our students. Well, at these other four schools, they had Spanish, they had, they had French, they had, some of them had German or Italian or Russian, but they didn't have exotic languages as they were they're then called, Chinese or Arabic. They didn't have those. Uh, I found out about a, an innovative program at SUNY Buffalo, which was called Text Tutor Tape, and it emphasized spoken exotic languages. It wasn't reading the literature or learning to write it, it was learning to converse in it. And what we were going to offer at SSU was exotic languages. All we needed was a native speaker of that language. We had many international students who were native speakers of many non-traditional languages. We needed a textbook and we needed a tape recorder. And at the end of the semester, after the student had studied in that way, he or she was examined by an outside examiner. And if they passed, they passed. And that was how we were able to give our students access to foreign language instruction they wouldn't have otherwise gotten and in exchange they could also go to any of these other four schools and take conventional languages that we were not allowed to teach. Mm -hmm. So it was a win-win and if anybody ever asked me on my epitaph, what do you want listed? I'm going to put HECA grant foreign language instruction. <laughs> I couldn't imagine a self-respecting school offering a liberal arts education that didn't have four language opportunities for students. You're, you were ahead of your time. Yes. And, and speaking of that, you also initiated during that time a student exchange program with the People's Republic of China. That's how we had so many students who could speak Chinese. Uh, uh, our president at the time, President Alex Lacey, had gone over to the People's Republic of China in 1982, and he established with in northern China in Harbin at, uh, at Heilongjiang University and in southern China in Shanghai at the Teachers University an exchange program. What they wanted in China was to send people who were teaching from their English departments, English as a second language, they wanted to send those, stu those teachers over here to universities like SSU where they could, they could enroll in English and they could become more effective in idioms, in the contemporary English lingo. These people knew the grammar. They had good vocabularies, but they took master's degrees in English. And we had about 20 of them over a period of years. And they would invite us to go over and teach there yeah. uh, on an exchange program. And a number of my colleagues did that. Uh, Dave and I were invited. We never went. Uh, our administrative and other responsibilities didn't allow it. But I did have the privilege of teaching uh, at least half, probably more than half of the exchange students, and they were often willing to be teachers in the text tutor tape program. Wow, wow. Okay, continuing during that time frame, you assisted Cullum Davis when he was VP of Academic Affairs for, I guess, 1982 to 83? Yes. Anything come to mind about that role? Um, yes. Uh, Cullum was Vice President for Academic Affairs the position John Kaiser had held. They were both history professors, both with PhDs from U of I. 
John had long gone to become president of Boise State, but Cullum was here for the long run. He's still in Springfield as a retiree. And Cullum realized when he was tapped by President Lacey to be the VPAA that he needed, among his other staff, someone who had credentials and credibility with the faculty to advise him on faculty issues. And he asked me if I would give up the deanship and if I would come in and do that. Uh, and I reluctantly did. I, I did it reluctantly because I felt like I had just hit my stride as a dean and now I was being asked to put on a different hat. But I did it because I respected Cullum and I knew that he was under intense pressure because by the early 1980s, just a decade after Sangamon State had been founded, we were already, although we were the new kid on the block and didn't have any fat to cut and didn't have a big alumni endowment to tap, we were already facing punishing uh, budget cuts and the threats of program cuts when uh, it was just he had to have strong support in the academic area to make the case that we needed more time and we needed more resources at a time when established universities were also fighting for their share and we were the 12th, we were the smallest, we were the strangest institution of those 12 public universities and it was hard. So I said, okay, Colm, I'll do it. It was a very, very challenging year, but uh, I hope I helped him. And then you helped the Board of Regents, which was the governing board at the time over right. Sangamon State with the project. Yes, the BOR being based, the BOR, Board of Regents, had Northern Illinois in DeKalb, they had Illinois State in Bloomington Normal, and they had us, SSU in Springfield. Their office was based here, down on the old State Capitol Square. And because of that proximity, uh, we often traded back and forth staff members temporarily that could be of service. They would send somebody like Dr. Carol Floyd from their staff, a Knox grad, out to SSU to help with some project where her expertise was needed. And they would send somebody like me who could write reports and type down there to help. And I was asked, I couldn't do any of the SSU program oversight because I would have had a conflict of interest. Okay. But I was a fresh pair of eyes to look at the new program requests and the program evaluations at Northern Illinois State. And so that was one of the jobs I took on. Also, the whole Board of Regents was trying to help support uh, minority access to higher education. And one of my tasks was to prepare a report on how our three universities within the Board of Regents were doing compared to best practices mm -hmm. elsewhere. So that was the kind of assignment I took on. Okay. Okay. Um, in 1991, I believe, Dr. Naomi Lin became the president yes. of the university, and seems like she asked you to help her right away. <laughs> she did. Um, like Cullum in 1982, she was wise enough as a faculty member and a former dean to realize that if you're working at the level of the presidency, uh, you need faculty members who are tenured, who know the lay of the land, who know where the skeletons are buried, who will tell you the truth because they've got job security when a lot of people are going to suck up to you and tell you what they think you want them to say and what they think you want to hear. So she came to me. I was waited. I wanted to go back to the faculty. That was always what I wanted to do. That was my element. She came to me and she said, I know you're itching to get out of administration and go back to teaching. But I feel like I need somebody who can tell me about the community, tell me about the faculty, be my eyes and ears where I can't be, give it to me straight, warn me when I'm gonna make a disastrous mistake. How could I say no? Um, so I said yes, and uh, I helped her with her correspondence. I helped her with her speech writing. But I think my major responsibility was we were tasked with writing a strategic plan. And she wanted me to be the secretary of the uh, uh, committee that worked on that a proposal because she knew I would ultimately be the one who would be the scribe and would put it together and I did and I was very proud of the work that committee did and that I could assist her in preparing that document which was crucial as a way of looking backward and looking forward. And you shared that with me and I looked at it and I was impressed by um, 
how you communicated with all the faculty through and students throughout the and process. <laughs> yes. Yes. yes, yes, and that the final product was definitely um, something that came from the whole community. It expressed everyone. You had to operate by consensus at SSU because the minute you neglected a constituency, you were in trouble. You would hear from them. I can imagine. Um, a big change came uh, with the Capital Scholars Program, yes. and that was created during Naomi Lynn's tenure, and it was in 2001, I believe. It involved the university converting from uh, an upper-level university, a two-year, to a four-year with undergrads, uh, undergraduate programs, and um, my understanding is freshmen were admitted for the first time. Yes, when Naomi arrived here in 1991, she had two huge goals in terms of what we could offer. And one, they were both about our, our programmatic offerings. She said, we cannot continue just offering junior and senior coursework to community college transfers. This is not viable. That model has not worked. There were a dozen or so of us out there, and all of them were going four year or closing their doors. She said, we have to be able, we have to find a way without threatening Springfield College, without threatening Lincoln Land, without threatening Illinois College and McMurray and Blackburn and Millican. We have to find a way to add freshmen and sophomores. And the way to do that turned out to be to do a very selective competitive program called Capital Scholars that would limit our enrollment to outstanding students and a small number of them initially. And we also were going to have to build dormitories, but for the first time we would have residential students because these would be people who needed to live on campus. We needed to become a four-year undergraduate institution. The other thing she realized was she felt we needed to offer a doctor. We'd always offered master's degrees in many of our fields, including English, but she felt we needed to offer a doctorate in public affairs. So she became a pioneer who oversaw as one of her administrative priorities doing both of those. And by far the most controver the more controversial was the Capital Scholars. And <clears throat> she selected to head that project up one of my protégés from the English department, a medievalist, Dr. Karen Moransky, who is now a dean out at Sonoma State in California. Uh, Karen put that program together and it became a success uh, and uh, it, it, it really uh, changed the campus. It used to be that when I would walk through the library, when I would see people in the stacks, they would look like me. They would be middle-aged. Uh, all of a sudden, after 1991, when the Capital Scholars started arriving, I'd see 18-year-olds, and sometimes they'd be necking in the stacks. And <laughs> I was unused to that because we didn't have 18-year-olds. All of my students were as old as I was or older when I began, but all of a sudden we had we had fresh blood, we had new students, and we had to be able to accommodate them, and it changed the complexion of the campus forever. Interesting. And you created a scholarship in Dave's name to help pay for certain expenses for That's the Capital right. Scholars. That's right. When Dave died unexpectedly in 1991, he um, I knew that he had been very supportive in Naomi's office. He was working there too as, as an associate, but uh, by that time maybe even associate chancellor. Um, uh, he was very supportive of Capital Scholars, but he knew that in addition to building dorms and having more activities for 18 and 19 year olds, we also needed to have a different look in our library because we had been supporting people who uh, were part-timers and who were older, all of a sudden, we needed to have uh, popular books. We needed to have videos and DVDs and CDs that would appeal to a younger audience. So when he died, I thought, what can I do to allow people who knew him and knew his teaching and research and creative writing uh, to remember him uh, that will benefit the university and the library that was the center of our life there on campus. And I created the David Everson Capital Scholars Fund to which people could contribute. And I think we raised about $20,000 uh, for an endowment from which then the library dean and his or her staff could draw uh, each year the interest and buy materials that would attract undergraduates and appeal to them when they came into their library. Okay. And I should mention, speaking of big changes, in uh, have to go back in time a little bit to 1995, but that's when Sangamon State became part of the University of Illinois. Oh, yes. Uh, and that was a very uh, 
difficult transition for us to make. And other than being the president and then the chancellor who helped us flesh out our offerings so that we could offer freshman, sophomore courses all the way up to the doctorate in public affairs. Dr. Lin's leadership in that was crucial. It was challenging because uh, the U of I was such a different player in state higher education, public higher education. They were the flagship mm -hmm. uh, in Urbana-Champaign. They were the, the research university. Here we were with our focus on excellence in instruction. There they were taking the top 10% if they were lucky. Here we were saying, y'all come. We're open admissions. We'll let you have a chance. We, we're not open exit. You're going to have to earn it, but we'll let you in and give you an opportunity. They were, we were to, we were, our faculty were totally different kinds of people, and our priorities had been different. And that was a, a, a give and take process in which I think U of I came to recognize through Naomi's leadership and getting to know our campus better that we had something to contribute, that we could be a jewel in the crown as a model of quality undergraduate and master's level in service training. We could offer that. We were good at that. We knew how to do that. And I thought they could also help us to realize that excellence in instruction wasn't enough and that our faculty needed if they were to be U of I faculty, they needed to be demonstrating their scholarship uh, more than they had been and judged on that more than the evaluations peer and student of their teaching. So that was a very fateful moment of transition and that it worked as well as it did, I think says a lot for both U of I's leadership, Dr. Jim Stuckel was the president at that time, and Chancellor Lynn's leadership. Quite, a, quite an initiative, Yes. quite an impact. <laughs> Continuing to this day. Yes. Um, tell me about the Brookings Library. I think that's oh. always been near and dear to your heart. Right. You were on the founding board in 1997 and then after retirement president of the Friends of Brookings Board. Yeah, I will never forget when Dr. Robert Spencer, our founding president, whom I mentioned a great deal in my earlier interview, said the heart and soul of any self-respecting campus is its library. And our first permanent building will be a library and a combined classroom office space for our faculty. Uh, in 1975, that building opened. It was our first brick and mortar building. We thought it represented an investment by the state and the taxpayers, the legislature and the taxpayers that said, we're not gonna shut you down. We have enough faith in you that we're going to put up an edifice that's visible to all, and it's the first of many. And it was a vote of confidence in our future. But it was also literally the heart of our campus because many of our, that's where I taught almost all my classes. Mm. That's where the English department was. That's where the history department was. That's where philosophy was. That, you know, that's where, it, it, was, um, it was where I taught it was where my students were constantly being sent to the library. It was where I worked with library colleagues to make sure my students knew about all the latest resources and reference materials in their field. Um, and it was a, a just a wonderful building, an asset to our campus. Uh, so when Ned Wass, who was then the dean of the library, wanted to create a a, a faculty advisory committee. He asked me as somebody who was in, the, in there all the time with my students and doing my own research, he said, would you be one of my faculty advisors? Keep me apprised of where we can be developing new programming, new collection building to support the classes here. And then we established a Friends of Brookings Library and I got to be one of the early presidents of it. Uh, and uh, that was a way to attract community support. And prominent people from the community were so grateful that they could come out and use our resources if they became friends of the library. Uh, and so uh, I was very proud to have a part in that. It was named for the first Board of Regents chair, okay. Norris L. Brookins. And more and more people don't recognize who he is or was, but he was 
the founding chair of our board, governing board, the Board of Regents, before we were part of the U of I system. And it was Dr. Spencer, more than anyone, who had that library gleam in his eye. He wanted us to have a million, a million volumes. We haven't reached that goal, but uh, it wasn't for want of trying. So you retired after 31 years of teaching in 2001. Uh, yes. But yet in 2002, you participated in something called the Odyssey Project. I had been named to the Illinois Humanities Council, which operates out of Chicago. Um, one of their faculty members, uh, they have them from all over the state. And one of their projects, which was based in Springfield, they asked me after I retired to be a part of supervising and evaluating as a former faculty member here. And it was led by one of my graduate students who had graduated, Nancy McKinney from Taylorville. Uh, it was a very exciting project. They had gotten a grant to fund lower income, poverty level students who were qualified by tests and other measures, reference letters, to participate in the Odyssey Project, which gave them free books and tuition for humanities-based courses offered in the evening in areas like history, literature, philosophy. And I got to be a part of going to some of those classes, helping, to re helping Nancy to recruit colleagues in all of those areas to come and teach. They got forgiveness of part of their teaching load from the campus, which was how the Humanities Council grant could cover it. And the students, I went to the first graduation ceremony for the students who had graduated from that program. And uh, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. These were often women who had been on welfare, who were getting a credential that was going to enable them to earn a, a living that would support them and their families. There were single mothers. Uh, there were people who had recovered from PTSD or addiction issues. It was a group of students who had gotten the chance of a lifetime, and it was all because of the Illinois Humanities Council grant. And I was so honored to just be a witness at it and to see the contributions that my junior colleagues out in the arts and sciences were making to broadening those students' horizons, getting them to read Robert Frost. and get, uh, It was just inspiring. Excellent. That must have been very rewarding. It was. You said at the end of your talk for the Sage Society about the founding of Sangamon State, now the University of Illinois at Springfield, that among the many contributions of the founding faculty were the graduates of the school in the room. Oh, yes. Are there particular former students of yours that you'd like to mention here? So many. Um, as I said, when I had to select just a few of my first year colleagues to highlight, I could have called the role and done so many of them, but there's always a time limit and selectivity is essential. Catherine, as you know, is a graduate of, of uh, not only Knox, but I'm sure you, you've attended other schools and probably gotten graduate, done graduate work yourself. Uh, the proof of the pudding of any educational institution is how do the students perform when they leave? It's not where they come in from. It's what they take away and what they're prepared then to contribute to their communities in their respective fields of influence. And I was blessed having taught so many of my courses in the English program. English majors tend to self-select. They don't come into that program as a major or a minor at the undergraduate or graduate level unless they love to read and write and talk about what they've read and written. And so I was spoiled in that I got people who were not in it for the money. They were in it for the intangibles. You don't become an English major if you plan to be a millionaire entrepreneur. You veer toward business or computer science or something else. But let me just highlight a couple of the students that I was so proud of. Um, one of them was uh, Kathleen Woldridge. She lived in one of the outlying communities. I don't remember now if it was Buffalo Mechanics or Athens. She was a commuter. She was a wife. She was a mother of growing kids who were in junior high, high school. 
Kathleen was one of the graduate assistants in our department. I got to know her well. She was taking courses with me, with Jackie. Jackie was helping her with a creative writing project, which became her master's thesis. She was very interested in Native American culture, and one of the innovative things we had done at our university, before it was fashionable, we had offered a lot of courses on women's studies, African American studies, Native American studies, we were ahead of the curve because we knew that was a trend and we were part of it. She had gotten interested in Cahokia down outside of East St. Louis and St. Louis, Monk's Mound, the largest city in North America uh, at, at the time. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to research it. And she, uh, I supervised an applied study semester where she went down and did a lot of extensive interviewing and on-site instruction. One of the things she did, because she was going to write a novel set in Cahokia in 1250 AD, she went down and got permission to sleep up on Monk's Mound so that she could watch the constellations and get a feeling for what that felt like and put that into her novel. She wrote this fabulous novel. I would bring her into my classes uh, to talk about the research she was doing. Uh, it, it was so fascinating. She was learning about that culture. She was learning firsthand from people, archeologists and others who were uncovering the site and talking with her. Uh, she wrote a novel called Cricket Sings. Cricket was the name of the young woman who was the heroine, the protagonist of the novel. And uh, it, it was published by Ohio State University Press. We brought her back to be one of our major presenters. Uh, she became a faculty member at University of Idaho in Pocatello. Uh, I'm so proud of having just had a small part of helping her realize her dream, which was a manifestation of what we were able to put together in the way of resources for her. And another person I'll mention was the guy who asked me to give the lecture to the Sage Society, my former graduate student, Bill Furry. Uh, Bill was every, every teacher's dream student. He was a journalist. He was an accomplished writer. Uh, he knew a great deal about history. Uh, he had been writing for the Illinois Times, one of their staff members, one, one of their editors. Uh, he was interested in taking my graduate seminar on William Faulkner, the Nobel Prize writer of the South, the, United, uh, the Southern United States. And in that course, he had to do a graduate project. Well, he said, uh, I keep reading that Faulkner did a lot of, a lot of his short stories were adapted to TV in the 1950s and that there are kinescopes, black and white kinescopes that have gone missing of some of these classic Faulkner adaptations for the screen. And I think I might know where they can be found. Mm. He, he said, I keep reading in Faulkner and film and all these supposedly authoritative bibliographies that these no longer exist. But he said, I think I can uncover them. But he needed to take a trip to New York City to do it because the museum uh, in New York City that had all these archives was in New York. And he was just a graduate student, not making a lot of money, uh, helping to support a family. Uh, his wife, Deb, taught at Lincoln Land. They had a special needs child. Uh, he, he said, I need to get to New York. I went to Chancellor Lynn, whom I knew well and who owed me a few favors. And I said, have we got a way that we can send a graduate student, El Cheapo, out to New York City to just kind of scratch this itch? She found the money. He got a ticket. He went out to New York City. Voila. The next thing I know, he is publishing his discovery of these two mystery lost tapes in the premier Faulkner journal. And he's identifying Sangamon State University as the place that helped him do it. And I'm saying, what could be more exciting? And uh, so those are just two. Uh, so many more wonderful student success stories because we were teaching small classes 
we got to know our students. They were number, never numbers to us. Our biggest classrooms held 50. You know, you get to know those people over a 16-week semester, and you know what they're interested in, and they're excited about that. And you remember, to go back to our interview, the people who believed in you and helped get you the resources to get where you wanted to go. All you want to do is clear the path. And it was so much fun to be part of a university that did that for so many lucky students. In 2010, you were given a Distinguished Service Award by the university for your commitment and advancement of the university. And in 2011, an endowment was created for the Judith Everson Professorship in English, a high honor in, in uh, academia. You've had a fascinating and rewarding career, Dr. Everson, and I so appreciate your sharing your memories with us. And thank you for inviting me. You're welcome.